All right. Well, uh, so thanks, Daryl. And as Daryl said, we've been friends for a long time and, uh, and colleagues. And uh, appreciate this opportunity for this weird little mashup because, you know, you're there on the other side of my screen. And we're here on this side of this screen. So we've got MBA on your side and Masters of Architecture on this side, the two different universities here, which is very cool. And so what our students can see um, on either side of me uh, is basically the same thing. They see the slides and they see all of you. So uh, from all of us, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you today about business communications. And, and what I think is, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a core, it's a, it's a key to everything. We actually gave my class a preview of this earlier. This term, if you confuse, you lose, is on the screen right now. And you can see it's a quote attributed to Donald Miller. Donald Miller is the CEO of, of a Story Brand, and uh, he's the author of a number of books, including Building a Story Brand. And that's actually the tagline for their company, if you confuse, you lose. They use it all the time in the podcast and other places. And I, I don't think we can oversell that statement at all. I don't think there's a way to oversell that statement. So let me start with a simple question. And uh, actually, you might hear the class. You might hear my class answer this question that I gave this preview. But for those of you at Butler, the question is what currency are we trading? Every single one of us is trading a certain currency. What is that currency? Does anybody have any ideas what currency we're trading? It might be the bid Franklin, it might be the Bitcoin. It's probably something else that you're asking about. Knowledge is a, that's a good answer, but the the answer that I'm looking for is actually trust. I don't care what you do, I don't care what who you work for, I don't care what your role is, whether you're sales, whether you're an architect, um, like the folks in this room, whether you are leading a not-for-profit, whether you're managing a team, whether you're leading some big corporation, we're all peddling in the currency of trust. Because the fact of the matter is, if I don't trust you, if your clients don't trust you, if your team doesn't trust you, if the stakeholders in this project, whoever they are, if they don't trust you, how can you lead me? How can you convince me? How can you sell this to me? How can you serve me? Right? If I have in the back of my mind that I don't trust you, and that doesn't have to be a like, nefarious thing, uh, but if for some reason I don't trust you, then we're probably not doing business. Then you're probably having trouble leading. Then we're having trouble communicating. Back to the, the overall topic of the evening. If I don't trust you, how can you, you know, fill in the blank there? Right? And so this extends through everything that you've been talking about tonight in your business communications. There has to be this level of trust. Are you telling the truth? Do I understand what you're saying? There's a lot that's wrapped up into that, and it could be in a memo, it could be in an email, it could be in a proposal, it could be in a presentation. We talked about this earlier. It could be in front of the city county council, whatever. I have to trust person that I'm communicating with, and they have to trust me in order for that communication to be effective. So trust is the currency that we're trading. And there's a concept that I like a lot that starts with clarity and ends with trust. And so here's, a, here's another question. What is clarity? What is clarity mean? Anybody know what clarity means? And you guys can answer this too if you want. Okay. Um, does anybody know what clarity means? It's something that probably seems pretty simple, right? You know, it's, are you being transparent? What are you telling me? Uh, is it clear, which is obvious, right? Is it intelligible? Is it something that I can start to comprehend? So when we get to the idea of, of trust, we have to understand that trust comes from understanding and understanding comes from clarity. So that's the book in this area, right? So if you want someone to trust you, 
if you're writing a proposal and it's, you want someone to trust you and uh, it's signed that proposal, it has to start with clarity so that then they can understand what we're proposing so that then they can trust us. Right? So what happens if you write a proposal? Let me ask this, how many of you on, on the Butler side, how many of you uh, are in a position where you write proposals? Anybody? Is anybody in sales? No, nobody. Okay. Is anybody having to present any information for approval? All right, we're falling dead on all accounts. It's awesome. It's a good, good way to get started. Okay. All right. So again, in your future, you know, just like the people in this room, in their future as architects, they're going to write proposals. In their future as architects. They're going to do presentations to clients or to some governing body or whatever it is. And, and you're, wherever you're headed, you may write a sales proposal. Or you may write a proposal to a boss and say, hey, I'd like to take on this project. Or you may propose something to a team. Hey, let's go this way. That could be in a business setting. It could be in an athletic setting. It could be in a military setting, wherever. Right? But no one's going with you. And, and all of this really comes down to leadership. Even in the scenario where an architect presents a proposal to a potential client, we're trying to lead them to a solution, we're trying to lead them to our solution, case ultimately for the folks in this room. Which makes that trust piece even more important. So, if there's zero clarity, if I present a proposal they don't understand it. If it's not clear, if what I'm presenting isn't clear, which means they don't understand it, then how are they going to trust me? I gave the example earlier to my class that one of the mistakes, one of the big mistakes, and if you go into sales, you need to remember this, one of the big mistakes is when people meet with a prospective client or customer, whatever you call them in your context, when you meet with someone, you hear what it is, that they need, you try to match up your solution with their problem so it's a good fit, you understand the scope that's involved, you have a conversation about what their budget is and all those things, and then you go back to your office. This happens in the architecture world all the time. They go back to their office and say, hey, we're going to uh, we appreciate, we, we, uh, it's a pleasure meeting you, we appreciate the opportunity, we're going to get you a proposal within 24 to 48 hours. And, uh, and then they go back to their office, they put together this proposal, it outlines the, skin, the, the scope, it outlines everything they talked about, um, it outlines their solution, their, their uh, uh, proposed solution, and then there's a number at the bottom, right? My fee for this is going to be X at the bottom. And like I said to the class, the first mistake, which is probably actually the second mistake that they make, is that they email that proposal to the client. So, in all likelihood, now I don't know about how things go down at Butler, you know, in the, in the Lacey School of Business. There. I know how things go down at Ball State and other universities. If the proposal is poorly written, let's just go out on a limb and say we don't have a ton of training, which is one of the beauties of this session that Daryl's doing with you today or tonight don't have a ton of training in writing proposals, it may be a poor to written the proposal. So that's, you know, let's strike number one. It's poorly written, maybe it's not very clear. You emailed it, which I think is a huge mistake. I would much rather deliver it so that I can walk through that proposal and have a conversation. Because in this whole, uh, this whole realm of business communications, yes, we might be talking about emails, we might be talking about proposals, but we might also be talking about a conversation or a presentation. It's all communication. Some of it's written, some of it's verbal. Maybe recording videos right, that go into emails. But I want the opportunity to discuss that proposal with the prospective clients. A lot of times it doesn't happen. So now I've sent a proposal, poorly written or not, accurately described or not, you know, scope and everything else needs accurately described or not. 
and it's got a number at the bottom that I'm hoping that they're going to say yes to. And the, the fee, the cost, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Sorry, I should have done that at the beginning. So, what you're seeing on the screen over here is uh, this is uh, ARC 620, which is a professional practice class in the Masters of Architecture program at Ball State. Uh, Ball State has moved the Masters of Urban Development, Masters of Architecture uh, from Muncie down to Indianapolis. So, we're basically on the old Angie's List campus. We have a building. It's called Cap Indy, which is College of Architecture and Planning. Cap Indy here, just literally, I mean, we're looking at downtown from the windows over here, uh, just sort of just east of downtown. And so all of the folks in this class are pursuing their, what we call their, locally, the, uh, their MR degree, so their Master's of Architecture degree, which means that they have an undergrad in something. Some of them have undergrads in, in architecture, some in broadcasting, some in in other other areas, but they by the time they finish this degree, they will have you know, a professional degree, is what it's called, in architecture, which means that after a certain amount of experience in offices, they can push the licensure, so they can license architects. So that's a little bit in the weeds, but but uh, this class is all about professional practice. So uh, we'll learn about. Uh, Ethics, and we'll learn about legal, and we'll learn about uh, fiduciary responsibilities, and all that is really my cover for running this as a startup innovator. Uh, we do a, we do a uh, project where uh, they're charged, and we're still talking about this. They can either go on their own, or in a in a small team, or as an entire class, they're going to do a project. And they, basically, they do a business plan. It culminates in um, the final. The final for the semester is basically sharpening. So we uh, we have pitch night, and uh, it's always interesting to see what they come up with. Some will some will probably come up with uh, a new idea for architecture practice. Some will come up with an app or a software or any number of ideas. And we've got 20 in the class uh, this semester. When I talked this last time, I think we had 15 minutes during COVID, and uh, we could have 15 that time, and the uh, sky's the limit. But we're, we're trying to learn the business of our architecture. In this class. Yeah. yeah, so in their world, in their future world, they're going to be, they're going to be trying, they're going to be trying to find clients for architectural services or whatever their business idea is. Maybe maybe by pitch night they're looking for investors. And so they're trying to get somebody to sign on to an idea. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a proposal for services. That would be very traditional, right? You, you want to hire an architect to design your home or your office, they're going to present a proposal and it's going to have a scope of work and it's going to probably reiterate what you talked about, what your needs are. Talk about deliverables, and then at the end of that, you're going to have a proposed fee, which I think is probably a mistake too. It's not the proposed fee. This is the fee that you're going to pay. Uh, that's, that's, that's a topic. That's for negotiations. But uh, so many times, especially during COVID, of course, right? When we can't meet people face to face, that gets email. And the problem with that whole scenario is that once that prospective client receives that proposal, if there's a surprise, and this gets to the heart of your business communications, if there's a surprise, the answer is no. Think about that for a minute. If they open up that email, they open up a PDF of the proposal that was sent them, and the price is too high, if they're surprised at how high the price is, if they open up that email and they start reading through the proposal and the scope is not at all what they understood the scope was going to be from the conversation, the answer is no. 
if they open it up and they scroll to the bottom and the number is much lower, you're surprised at how low the number is, the answer is no. If they open it up and they go through the scope and everything else and uh, it's a much broader or much narrower scope, you're surprised by that, the answer is no. Because what happens is when that surprise comes in, the clarity went away. Hopefully they had clarity at the end of that conversation that we had, right? Hey, thanks for the thanks for the meeting. We put a proposal together and get back get back to you with it. If they felt like there was clarity at the end of that and they're surprised by what's in that proposal, the clarity went away. The understanding went away. The trust went away. And so the next thing that goes through their head is, what are my other options? Okay, and so that's, that's what happens when surprise comes in. That's what happens when clarity goes away. That's what happens when we lose understanding, we lose trust. They start to look for other options. Same with, yeah. So there's a great book, and, and I don't know how this this applies really, really well to the people of this room and others in, in professional services and creative services. There's a book called "Win Without Pitching Manifesto Life" by uh, Blair Ends, and Blair defines this whole proposal agreement process a little bit differently than a lot of people do. What he calls the proposal is actually the conversation. And what he talks about in terms of what needs to happen in that conversation is that we need to get to sort of broad stroke agreement. So it starts with the it starts with the conversation where we're digging down, we're trying to figure out what the needs are, we're trying to figure out how what we do matches up, uh, how we can help them, if we can help them. Right? And if we can't, that, that needs to turn in a different direction. But but uh, but that conversation even needs to include at least a range of cost. So my my belief is, just like Blair Inns writes in Moon Without the Jim Manifesto, that it needs to start with a really in-depth conversation. So again, he calls that proposal most people don't. What he the next thing, the piece of paper with the signature line is what he calls it agreement. Fair enough. Right? That's, that's really what it is. That's what most people want to in our world call the proposal piece of it. But the point is, you need to have that conversation, whether you have a very prescribed process, or like a lot of these people, you know, when, when if, if anybody in this room that starts practicing architecture, one of the most common comments is that, well, every client in the project is different. That's, that's true. You know, if, if there, I, I see uh, four of you on the screen right now, if each one of you said, hey, I need someone to design a custom home, there'd be four different homes, right? Four different personalities, four different sets of needs, etc. So yeah, they're, they're right. Every client, every project is different. But, you know, we may have a pretty, pretty prescribed process for the design of that home, for the figuring out, we call it further, for figuring out what you need. How it needs to be arranged, and things like that. So I think I think there needs to be a very deep conversation at the beginning before you get to what you want. But you're exactly right when you say you know there are people in the room that may say, "Hey, I don't, I don't ever want to do sales." I don't do that. Uh, but if you want to leave not for profit. You gotta get people on board with your vision. 
same thing. You can make a proposal to them. It's not going to necessarily have a signature line. Right? It's not going to have, you know, this is the cost, but hey, follow me, and here's why. Uh, if you need a team, sports or otherwise, you know, corporate or otherwise, it's the same kind of thing. If you want to get anybody to follow you, basically in a proposal situation, even beyond the the, uh, uh, the marital kind, right? So, uh, so it, it's all about helping me understand why, why I should, uh, why I should trust you, why I should follow you. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't get it. Right? We talked about this earlier. One of the big problems in the world of professional services is you have highly educated, highly trained professionals, experts in the fields, etc. And so they operate at a point up here, and they have language, you know, they have jargon, they have all these things, this way of talking. And we were laughing about that earlier because at, at Ball State and other universities, there's the architecture building. That's where the, the people that are studying architecture, they go in there, they don't ever come out. You know, what's with these people? They're in there all night, right? And they're in there, they're designing, and they're having their juries and their critiques and their presentations, building models, doing, doing all the architects do things. They're learning a language that they learn to speak, their professors speak, the people that come in and, and judge their projects speak, but nobody else outside of the world speaks that language. That's a problem. But we have this thing called the curse of knowledge. And that curse of knowledge is really prevalent in professions. Because your experts in the because your profession you might be licensed. Not everybody knows what you know. Not everybody speaks the language that you speak. And so there are a lot of people that don't get it and try to communicate in a way that makes sense to them. And frankly, nobody else. You know, this, this guy on the screen right now, he doesn't get it. What do you mean? I can't use that, those words, that chart. I've got a friend uh, named Kathy Close Guest. She's in the tech world out in Silicon Valley. And she does a lot of the same things that I do. And she came up, she coined this phrase, jargon monoxide. And I said, Kathy, we need to take that half a step further and say, don't kill your prospects with jargon monoxide poison. Right? If you're using jargon that nobody else understands, if you're using industry jargon, you're going to lose, right? If you pack your proposal or email or presentation or whatever with a whole bunch of jargon that nobody else understands, there's going to be zero clarity. There's going to be zero understanding and zero trust. So how do we how do we learn to communicate with these people? Because they're by the time they raise their hand, again, you may not be in sales. Uh, if if for those in my room, when someone raises their hand and says, hey, I need to hire an architect, they basically said, my problem, this thing that I'm trying to solve, this thing that I'm trying to accomplish, is so big, it's so bad, it's so difficult, and I'm willing to pay you a pretty good amount of money to help me solve that problem. If you are a, uh, a leader of a team, Right? The people on your team are looking for somebody. They're saying, hey, we need someone to lead us. And a lot of them are looking around going, I don't want to do it. <laughs> when someone says, okay, who's going to lead this? Everybody takes one step backwards except the unsuspecting person. Right? It's now the default leader. Everybody's looking for someone to lead them. An organization or a group or a client or a customer on some level. Right? And so the question is, are you willing to be three things? Are you willing to be a teacher? Are you willing to be a great listener? And are you willing to be a guide? And I think, you know, these things might be out of order because when we get, you know, when we get, we need to get past that jargon and oxide poison. When we need to communicate, right, what we talked about earlier here in class, was meeting people where they are. We have to understand what their problems are. We have to understand what their needs are. We have to understand what their goals are. And we can't do that without being great listener. Right? If you think about conversations, quote unquote conversations, 
and the, oh, the other person spent the entire time talking about themselves, talking about what they thought was important. At the end of that conversation, and I, you know, I've seen this in a professional setting, uh, of course, as well, where you have someone come in and say, you know, this is what we do, this is what we sell, uh, this is what our organization does, whatever the context is, and they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk about their product or their service or their organization, how they're helping feed children or whatever it is, and they never stop to ask and to listen. And so there's no way that we even know what they don't understand. There's no way that we know what they don't have clarity on unless we are a great listener. So that's that's one of the pieces. And then the other, another piece is once we've listened to what they have to say, once we've listened to the problems that they have, the questions that they have, are we then willing to hear that and to teach them, to tell them what the answers are? The great thing about listening is that if we listen well enough, we'll understand their language. And just, just like all of these architecture students uh, have a pretty good grasp already on uh, artistry. So it's what's called the sequence for the jargon of our place. So they've got a good grasp on artist speed. But when they go and they meet with the client, if they really listen to that client, they'll start to hear the language of that client. And they'll start to figure out how to communicate in that client's language. And that is really important that we're communicating in the other the other person, the other groups, whether it's the volunteers or the investors or the potential clients or customers that we're communicating with them in their language and, and we're able to teach them, we're able to answer their questions to get them closer to the solution and then finally can we guide them to that solution hey here's the answers that you're looking for let me help you get there right? let me guide you to that point so if you are in sales or or if you are um, leading a team or something like that, let me guide you to that destination, to that goal, that thing that we need to accomplish, the problem that we need to solve. And so those those are three keys, you know, it goes right along with the uh, trust comes from, from understanding, understanding comes from clarity, well, we don't know what they are clear about, and so listen, they can, I, we can't help them understand that unless we're able to teach them. And what they're eventually looking for is a trust of God. And so that's, that's really our ultimate goal in this, uh, I hate to call it transaction, but we're committed to the same goal at least. Yeah. So Daryl, is what he's talking about right now is the fact that most of the people in the CPA uh, curriculum here are uh, going after masters, you say masters of leadership, masters of management. So they're, you know, they're all headed towards some sort of theoretically corporate leadership. Uh, and I think, I think the tie-in is, no matter what the scenario is, is management or sales or whatever, best thing that you can do, and, and like you said, I mean, it may be a cold, cold email or a cold call, <laughs> or something, something along those lines. Best thing that we can do is develop great listening skills. Best thing that we can do is have in our back pocket a handful of questions handful of really great questions that are open-ended questions that will tell us, you know, once, once the other person or the other people start to answer those questions, okay, 
So this is this is what we want to do. I was having this exact conversation earlier today. I laid out a scenario. I run these things called challenges. So about once a month, I run a challenge, and there, there are different different topics and different goals for the challenges. In, in a way, they're, they're definitely a, a marketing or marketing tool, right? There's going to be a pitch at the end for something, uh, but it's also a great educational uh, tools. It's uh, you know, I, I, I love it because the people that go through it get a ton of value out of it. Uh, they learn how to change their business uh, for free, you know, in exchange for being able, you know, at the end of the week or so to uh, get a pitch. And so we had this conversation today that I ran a challenge a few weeks ago. And I got to the, I got to the end and I basically said to the people in the challenge, I said, how, how can I help you continue what you started with this challenge? What do you need? Right? What do you need uh, in order to keep this process going? And there was sort of a consensus on what they what they thought would help them the most to move forward. That's not at all what I had prepared to pitch them. But I asked them the question they answered, and I said, okay, I can do that. And that was an extremely successful pitch. I basically gave them what they wanted. It was in the realm of, of what I do anyway. It's formatted differently and so on and so forth, but I asked what they wanted. They told me, they said, okay, here you go. You want to buy it? I said, yes. We ran another challenge just a, a few weeks after that with a very clear cut idea of what was going to be pitched at the end. It was basically a series of, of products, if you will, really services, but, but products that were without asking what they wanted, what they needed. And in my mind, these things really match up well with the next step they need to take. Guess what? They didn't agree. A couple people did, but most people did not. And that was a much less successful pitch, much less successful challenge in, in economic terms. And so that's that's another example of that that, uh, that curse of knowledge. Right? I assumed without asking. I went in and it, you know I can't necessarily call it a failure, but it definitely wasn't a success like that. And so you know slide right here says some refuse to believe it. They're gonna pitch their products, they're gonna pitch their services, they're gonna they're gonna talk about how great their organization is, the team is, in whatever their context is, without ever asking the question. Without ever taking the time out to figure out where the other people are, where the, the other teammates are, what they need, what they know, what they don't know, they want to know. And so when we you know when we're this guy this is kind of a, a clown kind of, a, kind of slide here, but when you're this guy, right, this is this is lack of communication. This is a whole lot of effort with little efficiency because he's not. Uh, we're presuming that he's not asking the questions. He's just pitching his stuff. He's churning and he's burning, and he's communicating. He's kicking emails out there, uh, maybe videos out there. He's making presentations and pitches. Having conversations, he's not listening. You can tell that. Right. And when when you get into that scenario, your business communication there are ten. say that not knowing your audience uh, is, is definitely right up there. And there, there are definitely scenarios where in lots of them where we're not going to know the audience, right? where we might be going to cold. Um, but the skill comes in how can we figure out as quickly as possible 
what they need, what they want, and put their pains on it. Sales, but but, uh, but the most successful there's a there's the Wolf of Wall Street guy, Gerald, what's his name? Who's that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, anybody know the Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you got answer from both sides. It's awesome. We all get an A for it. Um, he's got this. Shtick basically, and, and Leonardo DiCaprio does this in the movie where he says, Sell me this pen. And, and just Google that, right? Watch, watch, a, you know, watch a YouTube video of either Leonardo DiCaprio do it from the movie or this, the, the actual guy doing it. You know, honestly, you may, you may not care for the personality of the, the real life guy, but. It's a really great exercise because what he does is he, he walks up to someone, it's a test. You're in a bar, or maybe it's here in the classroom, and he says, sell me this pen. And what the natural instinct for a lot of people is, after they get over the surprise, they what the heck, this guy wants me to sell me pen. They start going, oh, well, this pen is great, and it writes really well, and it's blue, and it's, you know, whatever, all these benefits and features are. And that's exactly the wrong direction to go because you don't even know what I mean. The direction to go is, if we've never even met before in our entire lives, is to find out, do I write? What do I write with? Do I ever use it? What do I like it with? Right? Start asking questions to figure out you know, where our alignment is, the alignment of my needs and, and your product or service. And so to, you know, to get that into, you know, more specifically into your business communications that you're talking about tonight, uh, if you have the opportunity, get really good at asking great questions and, uh, and listening really well. Sometimes that might be in a form of survey or a poll on Facebook or you know, whatever, I don't know what, what the media is. Sometimes it might be opening up a meeting by saying, hey, uh, is, is there, are there specific, before I get started, I want to make sure that I address all of, all of your concerns. What specific questions do you have? Before we even get started, make sure that you've got this sort of presentation. Or, or you know, any, any sort of scenario like that, anything that you can do you know, if you're sending cold emails, I'd start with a question. I would make that first email really, really short, the, the, the whole idea of brevity. I want to know about you before I would tell you about me. So you can open up with questions. Um, you know, and I think, I think that's, that's the best skill, is the questions, the listening, getting to know people, you know, this last slide here. This is a question that meet them where they are. I guess you can't sell someone to them. So you have to meet them where they are. You have to, no matter what it is, whatever your context is, whatever you're trying to do, uh, you have to be able to meet them where they are, speak to them, et cetera.
example, if you don't think persuasion is part of the part of what you need to do, I don't know if any of you have kids, but you know, how do you get a kid to be questions? That takes persuasion. Unfortunately, my mom was obviously not very persuasive against the defendants. The are still the pain in existence. So, but, but, you know, that, that's the really simple example. No matter what you do, uh, persuasion is, is a big part of it. Slides, you know, get my phone number, text me, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Those are probably the, the two best methods of connecting. But uh, reach out to me, always uh, available and accessible.